Hello and welcome to this Podmedics podcast on thyroid pathology. My name is Nitin Lamba and I am a medical student at the University of Aberdeen. In this podcast, I will first be discussing the anatomy, histology and physiology of the thyroid gland. Then I will look at the etiology, clinical features, investigations and treatment of hypothyroidism and then for hyperthyroidism. The thyroid gland is situated in the anterior part of the neck, in the midline, extending superiorly from the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage, just below the laryngeal prominence, to the fifth or sixth tracheal ring inferiorly. It usually consists of two lateral lobes connected by an isthmus in the midline. However, occasionally there can be another lobe, known as the pyramidal lobe that extends from the superior part of the isthmus across the thyroid cartilage, attaching to the hyoid bone. The thyroid gland has a dual blood supply, with the superior aspect of the gland being supplied by the superior thyroid branch of the external carotid artery, whilst the inferior aspect of the gland is supplied by the inferior thyroid branch of the thyrocervical trunk, which itself is one of the main branches of the subclavian artery. Similarly, the superior thyroid veins drain into the internal jugular vein, whilst the inferior thyroid vein drains into the left brachiocephalic vein. In terms of its nerve supply, the thyroid gland is supplied by parasympathetic fibres of the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The functional unit of the thyroid gland is known as the follicle. This consists of epithelial cells surrounding a colloid. Follicular epithelial cells initially produce thyroglobulin, which is then secreted into the colloid lumen, where it reacts with iodine and the enzyme thyroid peroxidase to produce the thyroid hormones. These are mainly thyroxine, otherwise known as T4, but it also produces some of the metabolically active hormone triiodothyronine, otherwise known as T3. These hormones are stored in the colloid lumen until there is stimulation by thyroid stimulating hormone for the release of T3 and T4 into the circulation. The other type of cell in the follicle epithelium is the parafollicular or C cell, which produces calcitonin. This is a hormone which is involved in the metabolism of calcium, which is discussed in greater detail in a separate podcast on this website. As with most hormones, control of the release of thyroid hormone is achieved via a feedback mechanism. In this case, that is the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. Thyrotrophin releasing hormone, or TRH, is secreted in the hypothalamus, stimulating the release of thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, from the anterior pituitary gland into the systemic circulation. In turn, TSH stimulates the release of T3 and T4 from the thyroid gland, as well as stimulating the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. This mainly occurs in the liver, spleen and kidneys. An increase in thyroid hormone levels leads to negative feedback, where there is inhibition of the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary in producing TRH and TSH. Conversely, this system allows for an increase in TRH and TSH levels if there is a fall in thyroid hormone levels. I will now go on to talk about hypothyroidism. So this is a condition that is more common in women and more common in elderly patients. There are a multitude of causes. The most common cause of hypothyroidism in the UK is autoimmune thyroiditis. This may be associated with a goiter, as in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or it may be associated with thyroid atrophy. In most cases, there are serum autoantibodies present against thyroglobulin, thyroid peroxidase enzyme, and also against receptors to which TSH bind. Autoimmune thyroiditis can be associated with other autoimmune conditions, for example, pernicious anemia and Addison's disease. 
Other causes of hypothyroidism can be iatrogenic, such as following a thyroidectomy or following external beam radiotherapy to the head and neck. Other treatments for hyperthyroidism can also induce hypothyroidism, such as carbimazole and radioactive iodine. Globally, the most common cause of hypothyroidism is iodine deficiency. More rarer causes of hypothyroidism include pituitary tumours, craniopharyngiomas and Sheehan syndrome, which is caused by ischemic necrosis of the pituitary gland due to hypovolemia in the intrapartum and postpartum period. There are various clinical features associated with hypothyroidism, and these can be seen on the picture on the left-hand side of this screen. Features that are of greater significance and that are more likely to point to a diagnosis of hypothyroidism include tiredness, weight gain, cold intolerance, irritability, depression, dry and thin hair leading to alopecia, bradycardia, dry skin, and slow relaxing reflexes. Physical signs of hypothyroidism are often quite subtle, with initial inspection showing evidence of pallor with a so-called peaches and cream complexion and evidence of puffy face with periorbital edema and coarse facial features. The hypothyroid patient would also have dry brittle hair and nails, as well as macroglossia and loss of hair from the axillary and pubic regions. There would also be loss of hair from the lateral third of the eyebrow. The presence of a goiter in the case of Hashimoto's thyroiditis is also a strong indicator of hypothyroidism. To check if there is retrosternal extension of this goiter, Pemberton's test can be carried out by seeing if there is temporary superior vena cava obstruction evident after asking the patient to raise their hands above their head. There is often myxedema of the hands as well, and this tends to be non-pitting. Palpation of the skin would reveal rough, dry, flaking skin, which is cold to touch and is also inelastic. Often there would also be hoarseness of the voice, bradykinesia, proximal myopathy and hyporeflexia. Other features of hypothyroidism include Carpal tunnel syndrome, impaired hearing, menorrhagia, reduced fertility, and pericardial effusion. In terms of investigations, thyroid function tests should be carried out, and these would show an increase in TSH levels and a reduction in free T3 and T4 levels. An autoantibody screen for thyroglobulin antibody, thyroid peroxidase, and TSH receptor antibodies should also be carried out, as these are associated with autoimmune thyroiditis. Routine full blood count and use and ease would indicate a normochromic or macrocytic anemia and hyponatremia associated with SIADH. If there is a slightly increased TSH level, but a normal free T4 and T3 level, this is known as subclinical hypothyroidism. This is usually due to a chronic autoimmune thyroiditis and results in overt hypothyroidism in about 2-4% to of cases each year. However, treatment is usually not necessary, although regular annual thyroid function checks would be required at this stage, to determine if overt hypothyroidism develops. Management of hypothyroidism involves the use of levothyroxine, which will be required for the rest of the patient's life. Treatment with a steady dose is normally required for six to eight weeks before the effects can be seen clinically. Assessment of treatment effectiveness also involves carrying out thyroid function tests at this time. The main aim of this treatment is for the patient to have a normal serum TSH level. Once this has been achieved with a stable dose of levothyroxine, 
thyroid function tests can be repeated on an annual basis. In hypothyroid patients with ischemic heart disease, it is important to start treatment with levothyroxine at a low dose and increase cautiously the dose every three to six weeks until the patient is euthyroid. The reason for this is that levothyroxine can potentially incre increase the risk of precipitating angina in patients with ischemic heart disease. During pregnancy, and an increased level of TSH is associated with higher risk of miscarriage, preterm delivery, and also increased risk of lower IQ in the developing fetus. Therefore, the dose of levothyroxine needs to be increased by about 30 to 50 percent during weeks four to six of pregnancy. This needs to be done even if there is subclinical hypothyroidism. Then the TSH levels are rechecked after four weeks and are then checked in each trimester of the pregnancy. The dose of levothyroxine can then be reduced to pre-pregnancy levels approximately two to three months postpartum. However, a thyroid function test should be carried out prior to reducing the dose of levothyroxine. So now I'm going to go on just to talk about hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism is a common condition. Again, it tends to affect women more than men. However, hyperthyroidism mainly occurs in the age range of 20 to 40 years. The three most common conditions that cause hyperthyroidism are Graves' disease, which is the commonest cause, toxic multinodular goiter, and toxic adenoma. A rare cause of hyperthyroidism is de Quervain's thyroiditis, which is a transient hyperthyroidism caused by acute inflammation of the thyroid gland, secondary to a viral infection. So, as previously mentioned, Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. It is an autoimmune condition caused by oligoclonal IgG autoantibodies that bind to TSH receptors. This leads to the release of an excess amount of T3 and T4 by the thyroid gland. Graves' disease is differentiated from other causes of hyperthyroidism by the clinical triad of thyrotoxicosis, goiter, and characteristic ophthalmic features. Patients with Graves' disease usually present with eye signs before any of the other signs of hyperthyroidism. Patients often complain of a gritty sensation in their eyes. They may have reduced vision and photophobia involving both eyes. Retroorbital inflammation leads to the development of exophthalmos or proptosis, as well as the development of ophthalmoplegia. Proptosis eventually causes the other features of chemosis, which is conjunctival edema, lid lag, and corneal scarring. Clinical features that can also occur in hyperthyroidism due to other causes include many of the features illustrated in the picture on the left-hand side of the screen, such as muscle wasting, sweating, increased gastrointestinal motility, amenorrhea, and pretibial myxedema. However, like with hypothyroidism, there are several signs that are more likely to indicate a diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. These include weight loss, despite having an increased appetite, irritability, tremor, heat intolerance, tachycardia, warm peripheries, exophthalmos, lid lag, and a goiter. The presence of a thyroid brewery is also a strong indicator that there is active thyrotoxicosis. As when investigating hypothyroidism, patients with hyperthyroidism should have serum thyroid function tests carried out. 
These would show a low TSH level with a raised serum T3 and T4 level. An autoantibody screen for serum microsomal and thyroglobulin antibodies should be carried out, since these are present in most cases of Graves' disease. Thyroid ultrasound uh, will be able to distinguish a goiter due to Graves' compared to that due to a toxic adenoma. And therefore, this should be part of the investigations that need to be carried out. In patients with suspected Graves' disease, it is also important to carry out an MRI of the orbits to exclude any other possible causes of proptosis. These can include a retroorbital tumour. Treatment of hypothyroidism involves reducing thyroid hormone production by the thyroid gland. This can be achieved by medication, ablation with radioactive iodine, or surgery. Medical treatment involves the use of carb carbimazole. This acts by inhibiting the production of thyroxine, as well as by having an immunosuppressive effect. Carbimazole can take between 10 to 20 days to have any noticeable effect, and so in the interim, beta blockers can be used to provide symptomatic relief. The reason for this is that most of the symptoms associated with hypothyroidism are mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. Carbimazole is usually given at a full dose for approximately four to six weeks, at which point it is usually reduced over a period of 18 months to about 5 milligrams a day. Carbimazole is then stopped once the patient is euthyroid. The aim of medical treatment is to maintain a normal level of TSH and thyroxine. An important side effect of carbimazole is agranulocytosis. And so all patients taking carbimazole should be advised to seek urgent medical advice for a full blood count if they develop a sore throat and fever. An alternative to medical treatment is the use of radioactive iodine. This causes local irradiation and tissue damage to the gland, leading to normal thyroid function over the course of between one and three months. However, as with other forms of radiotherapy, it is contraindicated in those women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Surgery involves a subtotal thyroidectomy and is mainly indicated if there is failure of medical treatment, but it can also be considered if there is intolerance to medical treatment or if the patient has a large goiter. Complications of surgery include bleeding, which can potentially cause obstruction of the airway, Another complication is thyroid crisis. This is basically an acute thyrotoxicosis, which presents with fast atrial fibrillation, hyperthermia, and pulmonary edema. Other complications are hypocalcemia due to the removal of, or potential removal of the adjacent parathyroid glands, hoarseness of the voice due to damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, hypothyroidism, and also recurrent hyperthyroidism. So, in summary, in this podcast, I have looked at the normal structure and function of the thyroid gland, the main conditions that can affect it, and how these conditions can be treated. Thank you for listening.